We're taking a look at the sports drink market and how it has become intimately connected with leagues and athletes. Plus, two finals broadcasts are breaking barriers, MLB's London series is coming, and we're looking into the state of golf at a strange moment for the sport. It's Friday, June 7th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Hot off the presses, it's time for your top of the morning headline, sponsored by Wendy's. Wendy's new $3 English muffin deal is a proper meal. It includes your choice of a bacon, egg, and cheese, or a sausage, egg, and cheese English muffin sandwich, plus a side of small seasoned breakfast potatoes. All that is just $3 for a limited time. The Stanley Cup Finals starts on Saturday, and the NHL is offering a new way for deaf fans to enjoy the game. The league is partnering with PXP to produce a sign language broadcast, in which two broadcasters, Jason Altman and Noah Blankenship, will provide a sign language play-by-play. The Altcast will be available on ESPN Plus in the U.S. and on Sportsnet Plus in Canada. Staying with the NHL, the league is looking for its drive-to-survive moment. An NHL docuseries produced by box to box the same company that produced the F1 series Full Swing, and others has been picked up by Amazon. The series follows some of hockey's biggest stars, including three, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, and Matthew Kachuk, who are in the finals. Doris Burke made history last night as the first woman to call a major men's U.S. finals broadcast on television. It's the culmination of a historic broadcasting career that began in 1990. With ESPN expected to keep their NBA media rights for years to come, this could be the first finals of many for Burke. MLB's London series starts this weekend with the Phillies taking on the Mets at London Stadium, home to the Premier League's West Ham. This will be the last overseas trip for the league this year, which played spring training games in the Dominican Republic, its season opener in Seoul, and a series in Mexico City. MLB first played in London in 2019, then did so again last year. The four regular season games there have drawn over 54,000 fans each. And UConn seems to have anticipated that Dan Hurley would get other offers when they signed him. His contract with the university forces him to pay the school if he leaves for another team, with the fee decreasing each year. Leaving for an NBA team this year costs $1.9 million. Leaving for another college team costs $7.5 million. It's been one year since the PGA Tour and Saudi Public Investment Fund announced their intent to strike a deal, and we still don't have a deal. Joining me now to discuss is Front Office Sports Newsletter co-author David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you back on. So you wrote a piece uh, for us on um, these two tournaments happening this weekend that kind of perfectly encapsulate the state of golf. Uh, What's what's happening in golf this weekend? Yeah, exactly. So Thursday was June 6th, and that marked exactly one year since June 6th, 2023, when the PGA Tour shocked the world by announcing this bombshell uh, framework agreement with the PIF, uh, the financial backers of Live Golf. And everybody thought a year ago at this time that the PGA Tour and Liv were going to come to some sort of agreement to merge by the end of the year. And we would have all the stars back together at, at some point soon. And obviously uh, those complications started piling up right after that announcement. And, and here we are a year later. And so much has happened that it would take us hours to get into But yeah, basically this weekend we have the Memorial Tournament on the PGA Tour. It's a signature event hosted by Jack Nicklaus. It's a $20 million purse, $4 million to the winner. And then another part of the country, we have Live Golf playing in Houston with all of their stars and $25 million on the line, $4 million for their winner, $3 million for the winning team. And it's I just think it's kind of funny that we have – $45 $45 million up for grabs between 125 players, and uh, they're not all together. So it's it's just not where golf leaders envisioned the sport being a year ago, I don't think. That deadline that was at, was at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, uh, the, the deadline to make a deal, that's long gone. And when that passed, they said, well, you know, we're just going to keep talking. You know, that, yeah, that deadline exactly. didn't really mean anything, apparently. And, and then we've had the investment from Strategic Sports Group, which is, you know, a group of Steve Cohen, Arthur Blank, a bunch of um, U.S. sports team owners putting money into the PGA Tour. So they've got that to kind of keep going. And I think there is maybe some sentiment around, you know, once that happened of, do they need the, uh, the, the Saudi money at this point? Can they just continue on being the PGA Tour um, alongside Live Golf? Anyway, do has there been to your mind, some kind of vibe shift over 
say the last six months since that deadline came and went? Um, or are we just kind of still in this malaise? I don't think there's been much substantial change. And that's kind of the story. Um, when John Rahm defected in December and went from the PGA Tour to Live Golf, he thought that that would be some sort of bargaining chip and uh, an agreement would get done sooner rather than later. Rory McIlroy has been uh, very outspoken on some of his thoughts originally, very opposed to Live Golf. And now he just kind of wants everybody to get back together one way or another. He's not going to join Live, but he wants everybody to be playing together. Um, after the Players' Championship, you had a big meeting between some tour leadership and leadership from the PIF. And I think things like that are still going on. There might be another meeting. There's reports here and there, but there's there, there's something stopping the PGA Tour and the PIF from coming to an agreement. And I don't know if that's the future of Live Golf and the PIF wants Live to carry on and the PGA Tour wants to wipe it out, or maybe it's how players are going to return to the PGA Tour. But last year, we thought, oh, wow, they're, they're going to merge. Are they going to be back together in 2024? Then it kind of became clear uh, it, it'd be 2025 at the earliest because they have to start putting out these schedules. And, and we're kind of back in that same spot now. It, it'd be crazy to think that we're going to have some sort of meaningful change in 2025. So now we're looking at 2026 as maybe that's when we could have live stars, PGA Tour stars back together on some sort of circuit. Because right now all we're getting is seeing them at the major championships, which we'll, we'll see again next week at the U.S. Open. But that's just four times if, out of the year. It's not exactly what golf leaders want. Yeah, and that that delay of, okay, it's probably not going to be 2025. Maybe a deal gets done by 2025, but then <laughs> the, you know, schedule, you know, th things um, actually, the, the tournament's all uniting in some form. 2026 seems more likely now. That time delay feels significant itself because that's more time for, you know, maybe Liv poaches more stars. Maybe the PGA gets other investments you know, who knows, uh, knows, I guess we'll have time for um, Tiger Woods and Roy McElroy's new tech forward league to start up, whatever effect that's going to have. It just feels like it gives more time for things to change, unexpected things to happen. And it's not like this is just one linear path of eventually they'll get there. The more time this goes on, the more I think there, there's just not going to be a deal. Oh, absolutely. That's a great point because people can keep changing their mind with more time and people can get more fed up. And like you said, maybe new investors would want to come in and replace the PIF. I, I still think that's unlikely because in the end, the PIF has been very clear. They're going to be investing in golf. And if they can't do it with the PGA Tour, they're going to keep doing it with Live, And that's going to create this fraction and keep it going. And they're going to keep trying to get players away from the PGA Tour. And that's not what the PGA Tour wants. So I think they're very, very focused on getting a deal with the PIF but clearly they're having issues getting there. And yeah, we could be sitting here at the end of this year, into next year, still no deal. And then we're saying, oh, it's probably going to be 2027. And that, that's not what any of us want. Yeah. David Rumsey, interesting stuff. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Of course. Thank you. I'm joined now by Chief Marketing Officer of Body Armor, Tom Gargiulo. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much, Owen. Appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you on. So one thing I find kind of interesting about... Uh, drinks that are some combination of hydrating and energizing is that there is sort of a blank slate in terms of how you market and position them. You know, there's there's different paths you can go down there, obviously. Uh, the sports trinket market, sports... I don't know what I just said there. I'm going to take that again because I think I just garbled my words. Also, you're... Fro okay, yeah, you're unfrozen now. Um, sorry, take two. So one thing I find kind of interesting about... <clears throat> One thing I find kind of interesting about drinks that are some combination of hydrating and energizing is that there's sort of a blank slate when it comes to how you market and position them. The sports drink market has been very well established for a while now, but just looking at the beverage market generally, what are the advantages to designing and marketing a drink as a sports drink? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think um, sports drink are very unique in terms of they deliver a unique benefit, you know, and it's and that benefit is something that people um, generally need in either in the active sport when they're working out or, you know, if they're just in the, in the midst of a hot day or whatever. So, you know, it's critically important to stay hydrated. Um, and the fact that, you know, our products, you know, on Powerade with our sodium-based electrolytes uh, and then on the body armor side with our potassium-packed uh, electrolytes, 
we're able to deliver hydration in a very enjoyable and, and uh, delicious way. Yeah. And you work with you know a lot of major star athletes you know, like Joe Burrow, Alex Morgan, yeah. Christian McCaffrey. Not going to name them all, but there, there's a lot you know big names. Connor McDavid, some of the yeah. best athletes out there. How important are they to your brand? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we we like to dub them Team Body Armor. Um, you know, our collection of of awesome athletes. Um, Team Body Armor is, is arguably one of our most precious assets. Um, and it started back when the brand actually began, um, several years ago, you know, with the likes of, uh, Mike Trout and Anthony Rizzo and James Harden and eventually Kobe Bryant. Um, it's inherent in our business. Um, we love to leverage our team body armor, not only, you know, to help us communicate the brand and communicate the benefits of the brand, um, but also to, you know, give the brand credibility. Um, you know, because we're, we're partnering with the world's greatest athletes uh, to show that in order to get hit peak performance, you need, um, you know, the best superior hydration product in the market. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we leverage them. Um, but also given the fact that this is, you know, a very fragmented market, you know, Gen Z is, is looking more and more for, um, you know, different ways to be connected with outside of traditional TV you know, influencers and, and, um, you know, of the like are incredibly important and what better way to, you know, engage with our consumers than to have, you know, some of the most notable influencers in the world. Do you, um, other than just, these are very, very good athletes. They're the best at what yeah. they do. Are you looking for anything else in terms of who you partner with? In terms of athletes? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ultimately we're very, very, um, we, we do a lot of rigor in terms of uh, all of our athlete partners. Um, you know, first and foremost, we want to make sure that we work with partners that align with our brand. Um, and most importantly, that align with the culture of our brand. Um, you know, the mama mentality has been inherent in everything that we do, you know, ever since, you know, Kobe was a lead investor in this business. Um, and, you know, we're generally looking for individuals that are not only, trying to achieve peak performance and, and trying to achieve, you know, um, you know, the best that they possibly can, but they're constantly, you know, evolving and they're constantly finding ways to, to improve themselves. Um, you know, traditionally what we've done is we've partnered with athletes that are, you know, haven't necessarily hit their prime just yet. Um, you know, we have partners like, um, uh, Trey Young and Donovan uh, Mitchell. We have the Thompson sisters from the U.S. Women's National Team. You know, a lot of these people are are kind of on the rise. Um, yeah, we have Connor McDavid, who's arguably the best. Not arguably, he is the best hockey yeah, player. He's the best. We have Joe Burrow, who's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. But a, a majority of our roster are athletes that are striving to get to that top. Um, yeah, and it's something that we're very proud of because it reflects the brand and it reflects who we are. Yeah. And, you know, just, you know, thinking about that, that list of stars, to me, you've got, you know, we've got Connor McDavid, who's not only is, he's the best, he's in the Stanley Cup right now. Uh, Christian McCaffrey went to the Super Bowl. Yeah. On the other side, you know, Joe Burrow missed most of the season with an injury. Ronald Acuna just went down. How yeah. much does it matter to you, you know, the fates of these, these athletes? I mean, it, it is important because at the end of the day, when, when they're actually, um, you know, performing and, and they're on TV, people are watching them. And they're getting eyeballs and people are intrigued and engaged with them. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's part of the game. Um, you know, injuries happen in sports. Um, you know, like I said, we, we put a lot of rigor behind the athletes that we partner with. So we make sure that, you know, these athletes don't necessarily have, you know, bad track records or uh, bad, uh, you know, backgrounds or track records or, you know, have histories of, uh, you know, um, acting up outside of the field or outside of the, the, the stadium or arena. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, injuries are part of the game. And, you know, you take the good with the bad. Last year we had an unfortunate year with Joe Burrow where, you know, he, he got hurt um, and missed the season. But on the flip side, we had um, Ronald Acuna Jr. become the NL MVP. We had Christian yeah. McCaffrey go to the Super Bowl. Um, and that's one of the great things about having team body armor. We have a number of different athletes and we're able to, you know, duck and weave throughout the season based on how they're performing and, and um, whether or not they're on the field or not. 
earlier you mentioned how you know the, the media is more and more fractured and you know young people might be more influenced by you know someone they follow on TikTok or on youtube or whatever as opposed to you know um you know someone who's on a, a show on like a mainstream network yes how does that and in sports of course are kind of the what's holding a lot of this together as the one way you can get a big group of people watching the same thing at the same time how does all of that factor into how you try to get your brand in front of people? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, the reality of the situation is linear TV is it's it's a dying medium. Um, you know, less and less people are, you know, sitting down at eight o'clock every night and watching, you know, two hours worth of TV in, in, in a row and, um, you know, with their families and, and are engaged like they once were back in the 80s and 90s. Um, the fact of the matter is, especially with Gen Z, they're, they're, they're getting their information, they're getting their entertainment, they're getting their news, um, they're getting, you know, their sports from, you know, five, six, seven different devices or services, you know, throughout the day. So it's important that we have a, a strong presence across all of those platforms. Um, one of the few bright spots in linear TV that's still very strong and alive is live sports. And that's something that we're going to continue to invest in um, because it's a captive audience. They're highly engaged um, and, you know, the ratings are there. But, you know, we're spending more and more time and energy focusing our media dollars on social media, digital marketing, um, you know, areas where, again, we can have those one-to-one -one conversations with our consumers um, and engage them and, and kind of tell the brand story the way that, you know, they want to be told. Um, mm -hmm. which is something very unique versus kind of just a one-way communication that you traditionally have on TV. And does that affect how you ultimately position the brand? Because if you're, if you're sort of targeting more individually or, you know, maybe yeah. more towards subgroups, subcultures, um, as opposed to just, you know, the NFL, the NHL, you know, these big mega brands, obviously you've got that end as well, but I'm just wondering if, um, if the message changes on your end, because you can target people and groups uh, more specifically. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say the message um, gets, you know, it changes all that much at the end of the day. Um, you know, we stand by what the product stands for. We stand by what our point of differentiation is versus the competition, which is real ingredients. You know, we have nothing artificial in our products. Um, we are the superior hydration, you know, uh, option for, for athletes. And, you know, for us, it's about, you know, making sure that we're connecting with those people in the way that they want to be connected with, whether it be, you know, yeah, they participate in a certain sport or they watch a certain podcast or, you know, they, they follow a certain influencer. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, wherever uh, their hydration is top of mind, um, that we're making sure that our brand is at the, at the forefront and at top of mind uh, whenever they're making their, you know, beverage decision. And maybe along those lines, we've seen some recent trends in the fitness world, especially kind of in the pandemic and post pandemic, yeah. you know, so cycling's been steadily growing, pickleball is obviously still having its moment. Have yeah. you felt those trends on your end? Yeah, I mean, my my LinkedIn um, profile has been getting inundated with, uh, you know, just about every single sport you can imagine. And same sure. with my inbox. Um, no, but absolutely. I mean, the, those are sports that are starting to to really bubble up um, and gaining more and more um, uh, scale and more credibility. Um, and it's something that we're constantly looking at. Um, you know, hockey is a is a great example. I mean, hockey's always been kind of you know, it's one of the core four sports um, and, you know, but at the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, it's a very, you know, uh, we'll call it, it's a very polarizing sport in terms of the people that love it really love it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of overlap between hockey and other sports like football and baseball. Um, but we felt like this is, you know, a unique opportunity to partner with the NHL because the sport is at an all time high in terms of scoring, you know, the youth movement in the, in the league is absolutely uh, phenomenal. I mean, the average player is what, 22, 23 years old. Um, you know, all of the key players like Austin Matthews and Connor McDavid are, uh, absolutely, um, just a, a joy to watch. Um, you know, but it's also one of the fastest growing team sports in, in the U S uh, and Canada. So, you know, where we see an opportunity, where we see trends moving in the right direction, 
we're going to jump on that opportunity. Hockey is a perfect example of how we really leaned in very hard with, with an emerging sport. Yeah. Um, Coca-Cola bought a stake in body armor in 2018, bought the rest of it in November, 2021. Yeah. How is being owned by a giant like that changed how you operate? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think um, the beauty of the relationship between Body Armor and Coca-Cola is that we get to leverage, you know, the greatest strengths that the Coca-Cola company can bring to the table. And most of that is really driven by, you know, the, the fact that we have 68 bottlers across the country and thousands and thousands of representatives that walk into the store every day and build displays and pack product on shelf and, you know, make sure that our brand's are, um, you know, uh, front and center in front of our consumers. Um, and we're able to leverage all of those great bottlers and associates every single day. Um, and that's, you know, for us, that's probably one of the main breakthroughs of how this brand got from, you know, a couple hundred million dollars to over a billion dollars was really, you know, triggered by that, uh, by that opportunity. And then in addition to that, I mean, Coca-Cola is one of the most, you know, uh, prolific and one of the most, um, you know, uh, gifted marketing companies in the world. Um, some of the campaigns that Coca-Cola has launched are, I mean, are certainly iconic. Um, so tapping into some of the expertise uh, in Atlanta and with some of the, uh, you know, um, operating units across the globe um, and picking, lifting best practices and, and lifting uh, certain capabilities is, is only going to make us stronger. Um, so, you know, all I could say is that, you know, since this relationship started, you know, it's been uh, a dream for this brand. And now that Coca-Cola wholly owns us, you know, we're getting all the resources that we need in order to be successful. Um, and we're getting, you know, the, the eyeballs and we're getting the, you know, the, um, the, the share of voice uh, that this brand deserves in the market. Yeah. And I know people don't like to comment on other brands. Um, and I know that Red Bull is, um, you know, it's an energy drink, you're yeah. a sports drink, but to me, it's all kind of the same thing in that, Everyone's saying, drink this, it will make you perform better at an athletic task. Yeah. Um, I just, I find them fascinating in that they're not just, you know, one more name in the market. They own four soccer teams. They've got the top mm -hmm. F1 team. It's a different approach to saying like, we are sports, you know, we, we, we are the, the drink that, that makes you achieve greatness in sports. Um, I'm just wondering, like, kind of, what do you think about that alliance of, of you know, going from uh, just associating yourself with athletes and with leagues to being an actual owner? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's not something that we've really entertained just yet. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of money that that's involved yeah. with owning and operating a team. Um, you know, Red Bull, I think, has done a fantastic. I mean, that's that's basically how they came onto the scene. Um, and, and started to get noticed. Um, and you can argue they're one of the reasons why energy is a relevant category in sports um, because of yeah. what they've done. Um, you know, so, you know, I think it's remarkable what they've done. Um, and the fact that not only have they done it, but they've done it at such a high level um, with the teams that they run and in, in the, in the um, you know, in, in the leagues that they participate in, it's, it's, it's uh, incredibly um, uh, inspiring. But with that said, you know, I think for the near term, Body Armor is is very much focused on, again, the athletes and the leagues, uh, influencers and, and partnerships, not necessarily operating as as an, uh, an owner or an operator um, just yet. But never say never. Yeah. And anything you can point to in terms of like what is next for, for your brand or just, you know, trends you want to yeah. grab a hold of in the sports world? So we actually have some really exciting stuff happening over the course of the summer. Um, we've recently launched a couple of new innovations this year um, that are absolutely um, going wild in the market. Uh, we launched our new rapid rehydration line called Flash IV. Um, and that's a product where, you know, traditional body armor has about 750 electrolytes per bottle. Flash IV has about 2,300. So just imagine, you know, body armor uh, to the max. Um, and, uh, you know, we launched the product earlier this year. We leveraged the likes of Anita, the, the global pop icon. Um, and we got some really cool plans, you know, coming up over the course of this month, next month, and into, uh, into the later summer months, um, that we're really excited about. And then on the sports drink side of the equation, we also launched, uh, Body Armor Zero Sugar. Um, and the product is doing phenomenally well. 
Um, it's not necessarily cannibalizing any of our existing business. We're bringing a lot of new users into the category. Um, we launched a, a campaign with Olivia Culpo and Christian McCaffrey that, that, was do, that did incredibly well. Um, and we'll continue to do that through the rest of the year. But one of the most exciting, you know, um, things coming up is, you know, starting actually next week, um, we are partnering with Coca-Cola, where if you buy any fridge pack um, at any store, you get a free body armor with that purchase. So Coca-Cola sells anywhere between, you know, 55 and 60 million fridge packs in a month. So it's your opportunity to get a free bottle of body armor. Um, over, you know, over the next month, which is uh, something that this brand has never done before. All right, we'll leave it there. Tom Gargiulo, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Appreciate it. That's it for today. If you have a moment, drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen, or just throw us a like and subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.